problem. Okay, so uh, hi, my name is Michael Cadilli, and I am a staff designer at uh, Mattel. Um, we are located in El Segundo, California. Um, just to give you an idea where that is, uh, we are located right on the coast of, um, of uh, LA um, in a town called El Segundo, which is uh, ironically part of Space Park. Uh, Space Park is where a lot of the NASA and uh, SpaceX engineering all happen. And we just happen to be nestled in the actual building that I'm in used to be a aircraft engineering hangar. Um, I'm not, you know, obviously we have offices in here, so it's not wide open, but anyways, yeah. So we're located cool. in Space Park in El Segundo. Um, now getting into the design and process of things. I, uh, so I just give you a little background. I started out as an artist um, and from high school all the way up into college, I was studying art. But when I got to college, I decided to major in a few things that I thought were the future. Uh, one was holography, doing holograms. Um, the second was robotics um, and doing some small an uh, animatronic uh, uh, little things here and there, art pieces per se. And then I got into figure sculpture, so the study of human body and, and, and motion and structure. Uh, and then something into a little bit finer jewelry design where I was designing actual jewelry pieces. Uh, for my art, and then kind of collaborating and putting it all together and creating some of my own pieces. Um, from there, I had entered into the world of toy invention. Um, luckily, a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to get into toy invention. And I said, why not? You know, it sounded exciting. Toys, I love toys. Clearly, I work with toys. Um, but then working as a toy inventor for 15 years, I then got a, a job offer at uh, wh where I am now. So I moved from Chicago to California, uh, been here for eight years now and have been designing some amazing things. But I've also learned through those 15 years about the design process and building from nothing to creating a production piece that ends up on the store shelves, right? So there's a, there's a process that goes from point A of conception uh, all the way to the final Z, which is the product, um, and every little step on the way, there are, or there are, ex there are things you have to account for. Um, so, what I will show you guys at first, I'm going to show you one of my favorite toys, uh, I, and most of you guys have either seen or watched the movie Jurassic Park. So Jurassic Park then spawned the new movie Jurassic World, and if you guys are all familiar with Jurassic World. I work in the department of Mattel that is basically the entertainment side. So we focus on a lot of the movies uh, that are out there. So we picked up the Jurassic World license and Jurassic Park license, basically everything that uh, has to do with that, those movie franchises. And I was in charge of developing, and I, my job here at Mattel is developing the high-end, fully interactive robotic things or the wow uh, items that are for Mattel. So anything above $150, they come to me to make because they just need like, this has got to be a showstopper. So one of the things that I worked on for Jurassic World was Blue. And if you guys know who Blue is, Blue was the smart raptor from the uh, Jurassic Jurassic World franchise. So this started out as a concept. It actually started out as a T-Rex because everybody likes T-Rexes. Later, it turned into uh, uh, Blue, which was the main character of that, of that movie. So I'm gonna show you guys the first prototype that I built. And this is Blue right here. You can see it's a, it's a little dinosaur. Um, it has a controller. And you guys might be familiar with this if you ever owned a, a Nintendo Wii U, right? So there's a Wii U controller. So this controller controls this dinosaur. This started out as, this is all, uh, you guys can't really tell, but this is all 3D printed shells. Inside is a fully robotic exoskeleton internally that uh, makes this thing move and, and, and be animated. And so this was, this is, not to say the starting point of starting point A. This was after a couple other prototypes um, and building this, uh, 
going through all the processes and all, which I'll get into and all the processes and all the mistakes and all the discovery you're gonna make. This is, I just wanted to show you that this is the result of a prototype. Now this prototype that you make within production, before production is what's measured to the end of, to the end of the process. So my prototype uh, lives on all the way down to the final production because this is a reference point. Now, knowing that you've seen this, I will show you uh, in a little bit the final product, the final piece. But getting into that, Michael, yeah, how many, how many people worked on that prototype? Is it just you, or you got a team of like three or four? Somebody specializes in the the control functions. Is that one engineer? Or is it one designer? Okay, so my my position is the overall uh i i have the vision of the prototype um i work with mechanical engineers that are more experienced within complex gear trains and uh complex gear boxes but the overall robotics and the placement of what movement needs to happen and where it needs to happen is all based on me so um when it comes to other things like the electronics engineers for this. So I'm working with another electronics engineer. Uh, it's a company that I worked with out of San Francisco called IDO. IDO is a huge uh, technolo technology based company that, uh, that not only just uh, does technology for the masses, but for toys, interaction with like computers, apps, stuff like that. But they have a division that's dedicated to toys. So their robotics team, I worked one-on-one -on -one with this robotics team. Now this item, just to give you an idea, this item was three years in the making. So it takes three years to create something that is this high end. And when I mean high end, this is a $250 toy that has to meet expectations of a $250 toy. It has to be worth the money, right? So, uh, so along with the electronics engineer, uh, me, myself as the lead, uh, you know, the lead on this project and the mechanical engineer, you're also working with deco and paint. So you have to make sure in our division at Mattel, we have people that handle paint and have to make it look as real as possible. So um, I work with the movie studios and they send me images before anybody else sees them to the public. And I've got to make this, I have to make blue look exactly like blue does in the movie. So I'd say it's a team of probably uh, eight people in general, uh, because I'm also working with uh, product uh, engineers who have to source pieces that will be in production. Mind you, that prototype is all handmade. So how do you take something that's handmade and turn it into a production piece? Well, you have to sit down, take it apart, understand the engineering side of it, and what will last the lifetime of a toy. Uh, this isn't a disposable thing, so you have to think down the line. Anything you make has to be has to last in the consumer's eyes a long time. You know, basically as long as the user or consumer wants to keep it. So you you really have to do a lot of forward thinking when you are designing and building something that has to last the life of the toy, which ideally would be as long as the owner uses it. Cool. We just went over a little unit on reverse engineering. So basically you do the prototype and then you reverse engineer it to figure out how to mass produce it. Right. I'm so, getting your right. right. So exactly. That prototype. Okay. So just giving you an idea when you're uh, with now being COVID, it's, it's a little hard and we're doing a lot of things remotely. But prior to this, I believe I was traveling back and forth. I went back and forth on this project let's just say in one year, seven times, I was in Hong Kong and China. Um, and I was working directly with the engineers and my uh, production engineer and figuring out all the issues and the problems. Because when it got into the actual production side of it, that's where all the problems arise because these things have never been made before. This dinosaur, this robot has not been ever made before. So it's a big challenge for the engineers in Hong Kong, your partners at the factory where it's getting made, 
and then coming together and doing a lot of problem solving. And yes, it's a lot of reverse engineering, but because you have a prototype based on the, based on that, they can take that prototype and then uh, cultivate it and turn it into something that can be produced over and over and over again and be better than a company um, called Creativity. Again, this is in Palo Alto. This is in San Francisco. This is 30 minutes from Apple, Facebook, and stuff. This is another tech site that is known to bring life into animatronics. Now, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not an expert at programming. These people are. So when you are building things like this, you reach out to the people who know the most about the one thing that you need, right? You might be the most expert at building uh, mechanics and engineering, but that's part, that's part one. It's the user experience, that's part two. And in the end, then it's, it's about like, how do you present it as packaging? So this whole world of producing from prototyping to the end, you have so many steps. <laughs> so that's why I said A to Z, because every bit in the middle is just as important to get to the end product. Um, so um, I'm gonna show you guys the final piece to what I had made. And this is Alpha Training Blue. So I just wanna show you the, this is the size now, right? It's kind of small, right? And this is, this is fine if it's just for you and you built it just for yourself, but not good if you're gonna sell this to the masses. Here's the real size. As you can see, it got about 30% bigger, maybe 35% uh, bigger. And I'm gonna turn them on so you can see. So what I'm talking about, it's not just the look of this thing. Um, it's actually, there's so much more. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna turn my computer just a little so you guys can see in better light what it does. And maybe you guys can, uh, Let's go from here. Okay. So the controller is still designed just like the Wii U controller, but it's a little bigger. And as a matter of fact, I had to pay Nintendo a royalty just to use the same shape. So Nintendo owns a patent on the shape of this controller. So in order for me to use the same controller, I had to pay uh, a royalty is basically I'm paying somebody so I can use their uh, their proprietary uh, their proprietary design. So yes, this is all this is technically a licensed uh, controller because of the shape. Because of the shape, I mean, you so it would it was easier to take that and pay the royalty to them instead of just kind of reshaping it. That's interesting. Well, the nice thing about it was the ergonomics. So how it feels in the hand and how you hold it was very important to the user experience, right? Right. So it's one-handed too, instead of like a two-handed thing, which it's most one-handed. So I'm going to show you as as this thing moves. I'm going to show you guys how my hand how my hand moves on this thing as well. So there's a lot of tech that goes into this thing. Okay. So what I'm showing you now is I'm going to turn it on. And it's going to come alive, so just be ready for that. It's hanging out. This is hanging out. There's this blue right there. Okay. So now this thing is loaded with sensors. So not just the gameplay, but if I pass my hand in front of it, <laughs> he'll 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 he knows it. He also has it's called hap. It, he has a. Uh, touch sensors underneath his chin. So if I touch under his chin, he'll he'll react to that. And, on, and then on top of his head as well, he'll react to that. But here, I'm gonna unlock a mode. So on here, we have a mode button. So I'm gonna put him in. So if you watch my hand. Cool. And if I tip it up. So there's a motion controller within the controller. And so that frees you up. So I can control his head like this. And it's pretty active. Cool. So, but not only do I have that kind of control over his head, but I have, if I use the joystick here, I can. And then I can also 
move his eyes. I can make him blink. Dang. That is a ton of programming. Yes, there's so much programming. And then, um, but this is just, so because the controller is so small and I can hide the controller. I mean, it looks real, right guys? That's, that's the whole point of. Totally. I'm going to go buy one. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. That's just part of it. Okay. I just want to show you like a glimpse of like what goes into like a high end toy like that. So just, just in that little bit that I showed you, there's so much programming that goes within that, but also the mechanics that you have to tie in. Um, there are, I just want to let you know, there are programs, the programmers that, that I, that I worked with were ex Disney animators, right? So they've studied dinosaurs, they've studied movements of lizards and things like that. But what's really cool is that I supplied them with a 3D model of this dinosaur with the mechanical limitations that it has. So as they're animating it, they can animate it in CGI and create this dinosaur and then make it move within the limitations of the mechanics and then send that program right into that dinosaur. So this merging of technologies of digital animation into mechanical limitations gets you very lifelike movements within something like that, which is a real product, which is a real toy. So just, you know, combining those worlds as you guys are thinking about future careers or things to do, or if you guys, you know, say you don't want to get your hands dirty and build things, but you want to, you're so interested in mechanical engineering, uh, it's, you know, computer animation. It literally, you can add that and implement those pieces into a mechanical or true mechanical thing to give it life. Um, and that's another side of engineering that I, I literally discovered during my time building Blue. Um, so yeah, so going from that to that, and then you work with packaging and then the experience of oh, how gosh. to open this package, it's just, it becomes a very big, a production piece so you know just when you, you mentioned just, i mean is yeah. that a new thing all down because opening up an apple product is a joy right the way exactly. they pack is that a new thing in manufacturing that what you open up because they used to have like package rage trying to open up a cd you'd break the cd because you couldn't get the plastic off and now some of these products just opening the box is a pleasure yes so package engineering um, is also now about a consumer's experience about opening up that product and being, being welcomed into like, oh my gosh, I don't even want to take this out of the package, right? It's like, this is so beautiful. I don't want to do that. Um, there are packages that, that make you this, I just want to open the package and let it sit there, right? But when it comes to package engineering, the experience of opening up Blue was this whole thing where it came in a box that looked like a cage. You'd, you'd literally break the seal, pull them out, and then the whole diorama of where Owen found Blue was there. Like, it was this grassy landing. It was a place you could put them. You could put them back in the cage when you were done playing with them. But the box becomes just as important Interesting. to the experience, but also to the product. Because when you have a toy like this, it's something that you want to keep for a long time because it's play, it's interesting, it, it's really pretty, it's this, the, the paint works really, really good. It doesn't necessarily look like a toy to somebody. They may be like, well, that's a really cool model of a dinosaur. And then when you turn it on and it comes to life, they're like, wow, well, I didn't know that thing actually moved. You know, I thought it was just a static toy. So that all that experience is, is so valuable to people and, and you know, what, what they experience and what they want out of purchasing something that you make right so yeah but you guys have seen the mandalorian you guys know the floating baby yoda right the baby yoda crib so i actually made a floating baby yoda crib full size and it sits on top of a very expensive magnetic levitation system so it actually floats off the ground about three inches um and it holds baby yoda and the crib is just massive if you get a chance you I'm sure you can find the video of that if you want to share that with them later or the actual product shot of it um but uh, a lot of it, that's a one of one, right? So it's so because I sold one of them to a to 
actually he is the esports uh he's the esports manager for uh oh my gosh i can't believe i'm forgetting this um but he's an esports manager for Comcast. So he manages the esports team for Comcast. And he's a young guy, lives in uh, Hollywood. He bought it. He's a massive Star Wars fan, but he paid $12,000 for this floating baby Yoda crib because he knew the value of it. Like he knows he owns the only one that was sold. Now, I, so this is a Raptor mask that I made right here. So it's, it's, it's Blue's helmet. It's, it's a head of blue. So this is one of the ones that first came off the production line. So uh, if you open the jaw, your, your jaw opens the jaw. Like that. Cool. And the eyes move, as you can see, they're linked to the jaw. So this is all base. It goes on my face like that. Did you guys put that in production? Yes, this is in production right now. I mean, it's not anymore. This was this came out during the movie, but it has it has sounds and the eyes move and whatever. The next one coming out is a T Rex, uh, so you can be a T Rex. But um, that went into production, and just giving you an idea of like, okay, you may make something. How well did it do? That's another option. That Batman helmet was almost a no go, but it made forty million dollars for Mattel. Wow! So this helmet that was. Hey, I just want to make it, you know, out of the blue. I was like, I just want to make this because I wanted to do it. And I thought it was cool. And I got, I made it all the way through all the rounds of like approvals. Cause you have to get approved to keep going with this project. Ended up being a $40 million uh, product for Mattel. So $40 million off of one idea. Awesome. That's pretty successful. So just letting you guys know, like, you might think things are ridiculous and people might be like, Oh, that's crazy. Why would anybody do that? If you believe in it, you know, even this helmet too, this Raptor helmet was sold out. This made, I want to believe $125 million from Mattel. Just this, just this item. Anybody wow. want to speak up? You got any questions you want to ask? What was yeah. the biggest project you made? The biggest one. Oh, okay. Well, hang on, hang on. William, do you mean financially biggest or physically biggest? physically the physically biggest one that i ever made i will get it right now actually i was gonna show you the, the biggest production piece like actually went into production and made multiples of or the one just one piece or are production. you talking uh, production okay one second this is the justice league batmobile Sweet. that thing's awesome this is a one-tenth scaled rc batmobile uh this was the largest RC item and the largest Batmobile produced by any uh, toy company because it, it actually did so much, right? So this is, again, before I did this before Alpha Training Blue, which was, that's the name of the dinosaur I have. So Batman's inside. You can put him inside. He can steer. He has a camera over his shoulder. You control them with your phone and you could, there was augmented reality was like a new thing putting it into toys. So as you open the cabin up and uh, so Harley Quinn's in here now, I just put her in there. I thought it was funny, uh, but there's a camera over the shoulder that it gives you a first person view of what it's like to steer. And Batman steered the actual car. Um, as you turn the guns and turrets turn um, like that. And it actually had real smoke. So as you hit it, the exhaust actually blew smoke and it also changed levels. Um, this is literally the largest item that I've ever made. And uh, this was a $250 toy for that. Um, and uh, yeah, this was the largest thing that I think I ever put into production and uh, was one of the coolest because it- Questions. Um, do you guys get to watch the movies beforehand so that you guys make the toys? when the movie comes out? So a, a little bit of yes and a little bit of no. So I will tell you that I am working on an item for the new Batman, the, the new Batman movie. So, uh, so I've seen, they'll send you out shots, right? So they'll send you out product shots of what you're making. And so what I'm making, I'll see like everything of that one thing. So they'll send somebody to the studio and 
they'll give me a ton of photos. I mean, stuff that you probably will never see and like things that details that they think that I will need of that of that thing and like for blue i literally saw blue way before you guys would ever see it like i've seen the batmobile i worked on that thing was built off of 10 images that no one ever knew and it just just to give you an idea zach schneider the the actual reveal of that batmobile was the first reveal of what it would actually look like in the justice league movie and when it debuted at Toy Fair in New York, Zack Schneider actually had to see the pictures and then came to Mattel to see the model before he said, yeah, you can show it to the, to the public. Cool. So it was very, yeah, it's very secretive and it has to be the envisioning of, uh, let's say the producer, the artist, the comic writer. Yes, yeah, so we do see a lot of behind the scenes stuff way before, like a year in advance before you guys see maybe the first trailer or snippet. Um, besides the photos, what else do you have to go off of? Like, what are the kind of guidelines that they give you in order to make the toy? Okay, so usually it's, it's two things. One expectation is like how, what you're going to do. And two is price. So I usually ask two questions. I said, what, how far can I go? Like how, how willing are you letting me go with my imagination before it gets too ridiculous? Cause I will go crazy. Like if you don't stop me, I will spend money like it was nothing. Cause I will produce the best thing you can possibly imagine. But usually it's the number that price number is what they got to tell you that you cannot go over. So if they give me $250, you have to break it down like this. Retail price is $250. The cost of it is half of that right and then take that by half so if it's you know say it's 300 bucks you got 150 dollars like like wholesale price take 150 and divide that by two that is what you can afford to put in a toy because everybody's got to make money down the line so it's really about expectations and money when it comes down to it um there's a little wiggle, wiggle room like i produced the batmobile and it started as 150 dollars after I was done, marketing sees it and assesses the value and they go, no way, that thing's worth like $250. And then it changes your perspective of what you can put into the toy. Um, so yeah, so when it comes to product, it's, it's managing people's expectation on what they, what they believe is the worth of the, the cost of the toy versus the actual cost of what they want to sell it for. Those are literally the two things you're kind of living in between as a designer or as a product developer. And now if you're, if you're literally a product developer and you have to create a $20 water bottle, that's pretty easy. You know, it's like, oh, $20 water bottle, you know, no big deal. But if you got to build a $20 robotic toy, you're like, I've got $7, $5 to work with, right? You're just like, that's not even possible. A motor costs like a dollar. So you really have to like, as an engineer or somebody developing a product, you have to tell them, well, you can't afford that. If you want it to be that much, you can't afford the expectations you set for in the beginning. And then you, you who are the expert, will be like, I can do this, but that's about as much as you can afford. So. Um, what uh, projects have you done off of video games? Oh, okay. Off of video games? Uh, Halo. So, uh, we created a, a, I've created like a bunch of Halo guns, or sorry, I should say blasters, right? Because that's a politically correct term for toys in this day and age. I've worked on a lot of Halo uh, blasters. So when Mattel had a had developed its own uh, Nerf rival, right? It was called uh, Boomco. The ammo was better. It sounded better. It it, they weren't foam darts. They were plastic sleeve darts with rubber tips. If you can find them, I'll tell you, they're e highly easily uh, modifiable, right? So I have one here um, that is the shotgun to uh, the Halo shotgun. Um, and uh, based on this is video game, right? So uh, I've, we have, you know, 
we have Nerf gun boom code dart wars at work and whoever has the most powerful tends to win. So I myself am pride myself on the ability to uh, create, you know, hot, you know, better, better equipment when I need it. So uh, yeah, so Halo gun, uh, then uh, here's another one. It's a, it's a smaller one, but it's the, if you guys are familiar with Halo, clearly this is the, 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 the shotgun, the little hub, laser pistols. But um, not only that, but Fortnite, we've, I've done a Fortnite bus when we were going for Fortnite. Um, I actually created the, a, a bus that was a drone that, that would literally lift it up, a bus on a, like on a drone that would lift up to the sky and then I could pull a trigger and then it would release the, uh, it would release the troopers out the bottom of it and then come back down. So um, we always go shoot for that. Uh, Mario Brothers, uh, I created uh, Link's sword um, that was interactive. Like you could swipe it and just like that. So Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild, I created that sword from there, um, all based on video games. So video games are, are huge for us. Uh, we do a lot of the uh, Minecraft through Mattel. So we're constantly playing Minecraft around here just to figure out new ways to play, new kind of toys, new kind of items. So a lot of ideation that goes into that. Um, but yeah, we are constantly going after like video game licenses like crazy.